watching you on chat. Okay. okay. Okay, uh, hi and welcome everyone. As we have a couple of attenders so far. Um, looks like we have Beverly and Meredith here with us. Uh, we'll show the map here in just a second so you can see where everybody is from. Um, here is a slide that, so that we can use today so that we can um, say thanks to our sponsors, which are Blackboard Collaborate, which is uh, um, the platform that we're using right now to connect and learn together and also class flow, but then also the Learning Revolution project. Um, we have set up to where you can click on the star um, over on the tools on the left, and you can show us where you are coming from today. So let's go ahead and uh, be very interested to see where everybody is from. I am currently living here in St. Louis, Missouri, and I know that um, Nikki is joining us from up in Minnesota. If you want to, in the chat, you can go ahead and also write maybe the city that you're from. Let's see who's who's connecting is uh, Beverly. Are you from down south in Texas? Beverly's from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Hopefully we'll have some more people join us here. Meredith says, I'm not able to get my star to shine. <laughs> uh, whenever you click on the tool um, over on the left, like I just clicked it and actually erased my star. Meredith's from Reno, Nevada. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move forward. We might have, I'm hoping we'll have some more people join us. Uh, my session today is called um, A Framework for E-Learning. And uh, Today, um, I'm also going to be sharing with you a symbol which is going to showcase all the different tools that I'm presenting. I'm going to share this link here in the chat. And I need to remember to share it a few times so that people can get it if they come into this link. But this symbol here is just a great tool that we can use to um, kind of curate content uh, from around the web and share it with each other. Students can add it to their own symbols. You can have a classroom symbol. I think many of you are coming here tonight because you're interested in flipping your classrooms. It's definitely something that I do when I teach on my undergraduate students. And I'll talk to you, be talking more about that here uh, in a little bit. But this symbol here is just showcasing some different tools that I'm going to be showcasing uh, tonight. I am going to be uh, demoing some things from an e-learning module that I developed um, just to kind of showcase some of these tools. So I'm not just talking about the tool. I'm actually showing you some examples of how it was used. And I can uh, give you access to this course by sharing this link. It's all public, but some of the aspects of the course, unfortunately, you can't really fully access it unless you are actually enrolled in the course. So feel free to uh, shoot me an email or find me on Twitter or connect with me and say, hey, Dave, I'd like to actually take a look at that course and some of those tools and how that's some of the things that you showed and I can actually enroll you into the course. Um, the university that I currently teach at uses uh, the Canvas LMS and you can actually get uh, a free open Canvas LMS um, uh, shell that you can play in. Um, which I think would be a great tool for kind of you just kind of go in and check out and play around with if it's something that you're interested in. And uh, I don't know the limit on how many students you can put in or how long you have it, but I've had mine for well over a year and I've had people come in and out of it. Um, I've never actually taught a full class in my open shell because my university has, you know, a license and I just use the shells that they give me. Um, a little housekeeping. Um, this slide here is to kind of give some uh, attribution to some different um, things here in my presentation because I believe it's very important to share who the original creators are. For example, these images that you see over on the left-hand side, all of these images are created through the Noun Project. I don't know if you're familiar with the Noun Project, but if you are a creator of e-learning, the Noun Project is a great resource for you to get um, vector images. Vector images are fully scalable, so you can get this one image and you can actually make it really large or, or really small, and it keeps the same resolution, which is really nice. So you can easily change the colors and things like that. And as long as you attribute the creator of the vector image, you can actually um, use those for, for free educational use. Um, another thing that um, I used here to develop the color palette of this presentation, I used Adobe Cooler. If you're a huge fan of colors like me, um, you will 
really be amazed by the tool Adobe Cool. It's a free tool that you can use to um, create color palettes. You can create a color palette off of an image. You can also browse other users' color palettes, which is what I did uh, for this presentation, and I'm citing who the color palette is from. Another thing I'd like to point out is that in the lower um, left and right of my slides is where I'm going to be showcasing who the original creator of the image is. Many of my images are coming from Flickr Creative Commons, which I'm going to share a link for as well, which this is a great place you can go to get free and fair use images. But some of the images that I am sharing are copyrighted, so I will be sharing the copyright note about those images in the lower left. Also on the right, lower right, you'll see the little bookmark symbol, and that's where I'm going to be posting all the references, because a lot of these ideas that I'm sharing within the e-learning framework are not all mine. I mean, I've been learning about e-learning and doing e-learning for a while, and not all of these ideas are my original ideas, so I will share uh, references for those below. Another thing is I have my Twitter chat open, and if you're interested in chatting with me via Twitter, um, obviously the conference is using the hashtag reInvent14, but I also have a hash that I started last week with uh, um, the, the, the Innovate conference that was last week, and I'd be using e-learning framework as a hash. Um, if you're interested in chatting with me, perhaps after this conference using the hashtag. And I also just hope uh, you'll follow me on Twitter. And I can put my handle in here. And I'll also share it later on with the presentation as well. Here is a little bit about me. Um, I've been doing everything e-learning, and it's been my professional professional interest for almost 10 years. I did consider myself very much an e-learner. I love to learn online, and I often tell people that I'm a closet cafeteria mooker. I'm currently in three MOOCs right now. I have one that's finishing up this week. Um, I'm a wannabe researcher and keep a blog of my interests. Um, over this next year, I hope to have a few things coming out in a more formal setting with MOOCs. I'm hoping to be a Wayfinder and a MOOC on the Canvas network. Um, and then for the last five years, I've professionally been an instructional designer and trainer for a team that, as I was telling Nikki earlier, we're responsible for 550 courses that are taught by faculty all over the world. We have about 9,000 students across the globe. When, when, you, when you think about e-learning as e-learning standards, some universities are actually much larger than us. Um, uh, but anyways, we, we currently, I, I love anyways, we currently have about 64 countries represented and we have students in, in, all, in 50 different states. I've also been teaching three of my own web design courses online since 2011, and I keep in touch with about 250 of my students via Twitter and LinkedIn, even after the courses are over. But what I'm most excited about is, like I said, is I'm hoping to wayfind a MOOC. I'm hoping uh, the last MOOC I was in from the Canvas Network had about uh, I had about 10,000 students in it, so I'm really excited about the opportunity to actually lay find and lead um, students in a, in a connectivist MOOC um, or C MOOC, however you want to call it, um, and that might be um, later on in the fall. And if you're wondering why I have E's next to these names, e-learner, e-researcher, there's nothing new or weird. I just thought it would be cool to communicate and extend the online piece that's afforded when we use the term e-learning. If there isn't any questions, I'll wait for a second in the chat. Uh, Meredith said MOOC. Are you wondering, Meredith, what a MOOC is? A MOOC is a massive open online course. Um, yeah, I am going to talk a little bit, a little bit more about MOOCs here later, and I can, uh, especially if you connect with me on my blog, I write about MOOCs and my experiences in MOOCs all the time. So. Um, I would love to connect with you maybe after this presentation talk about how maybe you could consider doing a MOOC maybe for the, because I remember you're a principal in Reno, or maybe a principal in, uh, I mean, maybe having a MOOC for, for other for other uh, K through 6 uh, students or something like that. Beverly says she's attended two MOOCs. Well, that's, that's fun. Yeah, I, I love MOOCs. I'm currently in a MOOC right now that's being done by Stanford. Um, it's called Creativity and Music, um, which is really neat. So there's a lot of people, a lot of uh, musicians that are coming on just talking about uh, how they think creatively with the music they present, which is a fun move. Um, I'm also in a technology and innovation MOOC on the Canvas Network. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move forward. So you may be surprised that an instructional designer like myself is, uh, I'm not going to be talking to you today about a prescriptive process. Progressive prescriptive would be like something like, you know, if you do A, B, and C, this is going to happen. If you, and if you Google something like e-learning framework, 
you'll actually be able to find many people that are going to talk to you about a prescriptive process for e-learning. But I believe that e-learning is still very new. I still feel there's a lot to learn about e-learning, and the field is very much evolving. So in this set of instances, I don't believe that we should be kind of talking about e-learning as a this plus this equals this. Um, but I think all of us here today would agree that technology is changing. And I wonder if you would agree if learning is changed. Um, or maybe is it has our learners changed, perhaps? Or or maybe what is it that our learn or maybe is it what our learners want? Is that what's changing? Learners have been learning since they're since they're essentially been born in essentially the same way, excuse me same way their entire life, because learning hasn't changed. The same is true for all learners since the dawn of time, because learner, learning hasn't changed. So, so please don't think of e-learning as a new way to learn. We can discuss methods and mediums, but, but learning is still the same. So think of tonight's presentation as a way for me just to share some things that I think about whenever I'm designing anything involving e-learning. What we discuss here today might apply for MOOCs, uh, the classes that you may be flipping, K-12 e-learning, et cetera. And as you see, my, I'm kind of losing my voice a little bit because maybe I shouldn't be drinking coffee right now. But um, I hope you are too, and I hope we're just, you know, a group of us connecting through our screens. So again, why do I call it a framework? <coughs> Excuse me. I do believe that what I'm going to show you today is a framework. For example, here's a definition from Meridian Webster. Um, the framework is a structure of something. Most importantly, is a set of ideas that provide support for something. So think of this e-learning framework as that support, things that support e-learning. For example, we know the Constitution is, isn't necessarily very prescriptive. It's basically a set of conceptual ideas. So, so these are the set of ideas that I believe that must be considered, at least I try to consider them, and I believe these things support e-learning. And I think of these as my own personal framework for when I'm ever designing anything e-learning. And perhaps many of you may tonight be thinking about designing some of your own e-learning experiences. So maybe you're thinking about your students, um, what to do when we're designing e-learning, what type of an e-learning course to offer. There's many different things we can think about. And this framework here, I think, can help you think about those things a little bit clearer. Another thing I want to point out is just a reminder that not all of these ideas are original to me. And at the bottom right, I'm going to be citing the sources for them accordingly. So learning to learn, learn learning alone. Um, the first thing I'd like to start off chatting about is this notion that there is no classroom. No matter how interactive it is, there's still no classroom. And there's also no you that is a teacher in an e-learning module. This is not necessarily an original idea from me, and it might not be original from Michelle Pekansky Brock, if you're familiar with her work. But it definitely is a key one, because our students in e-learning experiences are essentially learning alone. Yes, learning alone can have its advantages, which is probably why e-learning is often the method chosen by many different students in the first place. It has its inherent disadvantages as well, and why students uh, perhaps sometimes not choose it. But we cannot neglect that it potentially can save time, cut costs. And there's always the plus of going to class in your pajamas. But still, as Michelle Bukansky Brock puts it, when you read her book or hear her at a conference, students are essentially isolated from their peers and their instructor. So what does that mean? <coughs> um, this is what happens when our students feel alone in an e-learning experience. We would probably, well, would hope that we would obviously want to decrease their anxieties, get them to use the technology, and make sure that they have a desire to complete the course. And yes, this obviously is easier said than done. But there's been research and much discussion about how to combat these issues specifically over the last few years. Some would say that a learner feels like they're learning alone potentially because they're miss it's missing one element. A recent MOOC 
that I participated in back in November on the Canvas network called Human Element, an essential online course component, shared this video with us, and I thought I would share it with us here today. So what I'm going to do, I'm sharing it here in the chat. Excuse me. And I'm also going to share it in the media library as well. Such a wonderful video from the Dow Chemical Company. I hope you all saw that, and I hope you can take this link um, with you. I'm going to wait a second because I think that it says um, some people might still be playing the current media. Could you send me a message in the chat to let me know that you finished watching the video? Yeah, I think it actually is finished. Okay. So I loved how it says, you know, the human element brings change, the human element. Um, uh, imagine that human element in, uh, an online, in an online course or some sort of an e-learning experience. And this course, the, the, the MOOC that I referenced earlier, the, from the human element, from the essential online course component through the Canvas Network, I really loved this course because I really felt like I was truly connected with other students. I mean, there was like over 10,000 students in this course. And uh, we really connected around the material, and we ch mainly because we all got together and we chatted on Twitter and uh, followed each other's blogs, things like that. And maybe some of them are even here attending this conference somewhere. Um, some other MOOCs and e-learning experiences that I've had in the past were not set up this way. I really felt like I was learning alone. Um, even courses that I personally designed many years ago, and I know <clears throat> I've even learned and heard of some of my learners' anxieties firsthand because they've told me that they feel like they're learning alone. And as much as we design our online experiences to be the same as our face-to-face -face classes, because, you know, we're trying to flip our classes, we're trying to set it up to where we can save seat time and where they can do some of that work at home, but when they're doing that, um, without the human element, sometimes it may not be as successful. But does every course have to have the human element? And I would say it, it really depends on the needs. And perhaps we can look at this image here of someone ordering some fast food and we can think of this analogy. You know, probably here after this presentation, this is what I'm going to be doing. Um, we drive through a fast food restaurant. We see a very clear menu. We order exactly what we want. And we accomplish our objective. They, they, they give us exactly what we want. We can eat in our car. We can drive away. Sometimes I think our e-learning experiences can be done this way as well. So like I said, depending on the objectives of the learner, their own personal goals, but also the objectives of the course and maybe the objectives of the institution, sometimes learning can be quick, cheap, and easy. And it's, and that's perfectly fine. Some MOOCs are designed this way. But then, you know, some of our courses or experiences in life can have that human element. Now, take a look at this image of a home-cooked meal. 
imagine this, maybe I look at this and think this is just, you know, a family sitting down to dinner. Maybe they've had a hard day at work. They're all coming together, um, sitting around the table, um, longing for the conversation. They're excited to be here. Everyone is connecting. They're spending time together. The content essentially is the food, but they're spending time talking about it. They're eating it. They're enjoying it. They're spending time with one another. Perhaps you want to design experiences that are like this, where students feel like they're part of the conversation. There's much that can be discussed in terms of how to write our discussion questions, how to use emerging technologies, and how to personalize our feedback so that maybe we can have this type of a human element um, in our courses. I'm going to be chatting about some of that here tonight. Um, a while back, I came across an article from Educause, which really helped me to understand more so how I should teach. As a field, we've been talking about Ray Kurzweil's learning by doing for some time. Um, much of the buzz in K-12 lately has even been talking about learning by doing or the maker movement. Um, but be sure you check out uh, some of the keynotes because they've hit on some of this well, uh, this topic as well if you perhaps missed them earlier today. Um, the department where I work uses this graphic currently as we teach our, our new online instructors about how to be online teachers. And this graphic here also applies for face-to-face -face teaching um, because essentially, you know, what you do in a face-to-face -face class as a teacher really isn't very different from what you do in an online class as a teacher. Um, maybe you've seen a similar matrix. Maybe you've been in a class that had low teaching and low learning. Maybe you were in a course where the instructor was trying really hard, but you still had a difficult time trying to learn from them. Um, but this article from Marilyn Lombardi discusses the value of learning by doing. She shared that what we should be doing is we should be using the technology available to assist in problem solving, giving students real-world problems and ill-defined problems. Um, I mean, when you think of that, doesn't that sound like, doesn't that sound like much more authentic learning? A quick example of this is an instructional designer for e-learning. Um, I've actually had instructors that come to me and they ask me to upload their face-to-face -face PowerPoints into their, in their class and I try to tell them, well, how is that, how is that authentic? Because when you teach this class face to face, you put your PowerPoint up on the screen behind you and you walk around the classroom and you're talking about what's on the PowerPoint. Essentially, your expertise in the classroom and the PowerPoint is essentially guiding the conversation. But when you just put the PowerPoint up in an online class, that expertise, that narration is essentially missing. Um, I've also had instructors come to me and they say, is it possible for students to mail me their final papers? They don't want students to submit anything in the online platform. They want them to mail them to their home address or, or to the campus or something like that. Or is it possible for me to print out um, a paper that someone submits to me in the class, uh, write on it, you know, mark it all up, and then I can maybe fax it back to them? Um, I get these types of problems all the time. And, you know, uh, and it's my job as instructors as I'm to try to take Take the, make the technology easy for the instructor to kind of show them that there is a way to do all of this in a much more authentic way online. Because uh, sometimes, I, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of working with instructors that are essentially going against the technology. But, but when students are involved in high learning, whether or not the teaching is high, um, the student isn't disconnected. Students have been learning since the dawn of civilization, like I was talking about earlier. It's nothing new, but learning, but when learning is authentic, especially in an online setting, um, it builds com a community of engaged learners, it provides opportunities for collaboration, it demonstrates the relevance of learning, and it transfers learning to new situations. Remember, like I've said uh, many times, learning is nothing new, um, but like I said, if learning isn't authentic, then, then it, builds a it doesn't build a community of engaged learners, it doesn't provide opportunities for collaboration, and it may or may not demonstrate relevance of learning or transfer to new authentic situations. So that's why we can't forget that human element and, and how crucial that is for authentic learning. So whenever I'm designing an e-learning experience, I believe that we need to think of ways to put the student at the center of our designs. Um, we try to figure out different events, activities, assignments that will get them to interact more with each other, the instructor, and the content. Um, so we have basically what I call student-to-student -student interaction, student-to-instructor, student-to-content types of interaction. Student-to-student could be designing group activities that maybe could be done from home um, after they, if you're flipping your classroom, maybe it's something they can go home and do as a group online. Um, maybe writing discussion questions in a specific way that fosters that type of interaction. Um, student-to-instructor 
This may be designing activities where the instructor can provide some sort of formative feedback where they can actually have a moment to truly connect with the student on a personal level. Depending on the expectations of the learner, the institution, maybe students need to have one-on-one -on -one interaction with their instructor via Skype or some sort of a, a thing. But then whenever I teach online courses within the first two weeks, I try to actually set up a Skype session with my students so I can actually at least have that moment, one moment in the course where I actually can, you know, see my student face to face and really talk with them and address their concerns. Um, student to content. This is where I spend a lot of my time as instructor designers trying to figure out how to get students to interact more with the content. Um, uh, make, sometimes we try to make content much more interactive, work with the instructor to develop simulations and uh, games and things that they can do online. Um, you've probably been hearing a lot about gamification here lately, but it isn't necessarily confined just to some sort of a flash object or some kind of a game that the students play, like a video game online. Gamification, in, in its raw sense, is essentially taking a course and kind of making it into some sort of a fun scenario. For example, I teach a capstone computer science class, and at the very beginning of the class, I try to make it seem like they're pitching an idea to a client, and essentially the whole class is the client. So I, I walk them through um, pitching something to a client, the revisions of, the, of their design of their website, and things like that. And pr pr prior to doing that type of a gamification type of a thing with, with this class, this, I swear the, the students really just shared very just basic websites, but once we invested the students in a uh, such a rich uh, scenario of them actually pitching to somebody somebody real and actually getting real feedback from the whole class and, and from myself, their, their designs and their final projects just became much more involved, much more creative, things like that. Um, not all e-learning experiences necessarily can have these three different types of, of, of interactions, but I, I suspect that many of you are here today because you're trying to figure out maybe some interesting ideas or ways to make learning much more authentic. Um, speaking of engaging in interactive content, um, it's important to note that interactive content can often be a double-edged sword. It can often be distracting. There are new tools in Web 2.0 that come out daily, and they all claim to be the latest and greatest for engagement. But how do these inventions innovate learning? And what I want to point out is that not all of these inventions are innovative. Um, so before I show showing off some technology, I want to make sure that you know one thing. It's about increasing learning and not about using technology for the sake of technology. I hope that, that those of you would agree with me about that. And, um, and you're also probably wondering why in the world is he showing me an image of chocolate chips? Well, for example, chocolate has been around for thousands of years, but according to Wikipedia, it was in 1937 that Ruth Graves Wakefield of Toll House Inn in Whitman, Massachusetts invented the chocolate chip, supposedly by accident. Using broken pieces of chocolate in an innovative way, innovative way, even if by accident, made our favorite cookie, made America's favorite cookie, which was later capitalized on by Nestle, and the name of Toll House was branded. But it takes an innovator like Ruth to try something new with something that has been around for thousands of years. The same is true for us today when te with technology, especially when it comes to e-learning. But what I often find is that people in the industry are often talking more about the noun than the verb. It's not about what LMS you use or, or what, it's about what you do with the LMS. It's not about whether you're using Prezi or PowerPoint, it's whether you engage your audience with your presentation. So can we take something like Twitter and use it online for class for learning, um, which is just a simple social media tool? There's lots of inventions out there, but we don't have to use them all. <laughs> it's about how we get students, what we get students to do with them that really matters, because learning is nothing new. But some things can distract from learning. So in terms of distraction, we need to make sure that everything we add in the online course should always add value. Whenever you flip your class, whenever you're putting resources into a, uh, an, an area online for students to interact with on, online after they go home, then you, everything in the course really doesn't add value because I'm telling you things are going to distract them. And when you distract them, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and I use this graphic here mostly for my undergraduate web design students because when students build their first uh, website, they, they put in lots of distracting things. They, they make green backgrounds and red text and things like that. So I try to talk to them 
but we have to be have this balance between the content, which is what the user needs, and that's what the user's coming there to do. The design is what the user sees, and that's what hits them in the face as soon as they get to the website. And functionality, that's what the user actually does to get the content. Um, and we need to make sure that everything in our courses adds value because the content is what the user wants most and is what they need. And when you have all of these things aligned, essentially the user can get to the content and get to what they need. And when they do, that's when the user or our students are happy. So please note that the functionality should always have value. Design of the content should always have value. Um, and the content should always have value. Uh, sometimes you really have, uh, I work with courses that have been around for four or five years, and I look at them and I think, maybe we've had thousands of students take this course, and there's something that's just so glaring and distracting, or there's something that just really doesn't work, or why did the instructor set up something in a specific way that kind of took students off on a wrong tangent? Because we want to make sure that all of these things add value. If, if we don't, it will be distracting. And, um, and I often wonder how in the world our learners can learn from this, because when things are distracting, um, uh, either the content, function, or design is distracting them, it decreases the learner's ability to meet the learning goals, and it decreases their ability to accomplish the objectives. I'm going to take a pause and answer some questions. Uh, Nikki wrote, a big issue, online instructors should give minimal feedback if any content at all, discussion forms are too far of instructor presence. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that could be the case. Um, in some of the classes that you've taken or, or classes that you're the instructor, instructional technologist on or for, and you're trying to get the instructors to come in and have, have a presence. Um, my personal thing that I do when I work with instructors or me for even when I teach online is I think instructors um, interacting in an online class can kind of be, there's, there's really, the best way I, I always try to say it is that instructors should just have a presence and they should help their goal is to keep the conversation moving forward. Um, I work with instructors that have actually tried to post on every single thing a student has said, and that really makes conversation kind of hard, because that's not what you would do in a face-to-face -face class, or if you did, then your students would really think you were pretty rude in a face-to-face -face course. Um, so I, I say that, you know, make your questions open-ended, where diverse opinions can be shared, and maybe encourage the students to ask each other questions in the in the discussion area, make uh, try to make sure that the questions aren't just very factual or, or lend themselves to very factual answers. Don't ask things like, when did, have a class discussion question with 30 people, like, when did Columbus sail the ocean blue? Essentially, they're all going to say the same thing. But what if you were to ask the question, you know, why did Columbus sail the ocean blue? Something like that. So where people from all around the world can discuss their opinions and perspectives of that. Uh, and then the goal of the instructor is just to kind of carry that conversation forward, not necessarily comment on everything. Um, that they said. Yeah, apps and instructors are very frustrated online. Yeah, that's that's unfortunate. At the university where I teach at, um, online instructors actually get paid a little bit more to teach online, so their expectations are a little bit higher, and they're supposed to, we train them on how to have that presence um, in our online classes. Any other questions before I keep going? I'm about to jump into our e-learning module, which I'm going to be showing some screenshots of. I'm going to share the link for the e-learning module again because I know some of you have come in late. I'm sharing it here in the chat. Um, I'm not going to do a, a tour of it here. I'm just going to show you some screenshots. And basically, I'm just using this e-learning module just as a kind of a, a template to kind of show you some different activities and different tools. So I don't want to just have this session just be, hey, here's 50 new tools. I've actually specifically chosen a few of them here, and I'm going to show you how I use it in the e-learning module. And again, I'm going to share the symbol, uh, which shows all of these tools. So after you leave here today, feel free to take the symbol with you. Um, this link here is the link here. This is will give you access to all the different tools that I have. There's all the different tools and learning technologies that I'm presenting. And if you're interested, you can, no one currently is tweeting with me, but I'm going to share with you. Um, uh, uh, I encourage you to share the, the, the hash. Oh, hang on. New slide. Uh, chat with me on the hash reInvent14 or a hash e-learning framework. So this here is the slide um, of the first thing the students saw in this e-learning uh, course that I built that's going to showcase some of these tools. Um, 
I built this, so just so you know the audience, I built this from a lot, some librarians in higher education who were interested in increasing the digital media literacy of their library patrons. So taking account the audience and who they were and their needs, we needed the very first page of the e-learning module to really personalize the experience for them, to get them engaged, and make sure they knew the WIFM, which stands for uh, what's in it for me. We wanted to make sure that we set the expectations of the module up front. So thinking of doing something similar in your courses, would it, would it add value for your students to be introduced to the course um, with by their actual instructor? You know, um, you know, if you're flipping the classroom, you know, your students are kind of already building a relationship with you and they're with you in the face-to-face -face classroom, but maybe if some of you are interested in actually having a truly online course, imagine if your students could actually see see you have a personalized introduction from, from you and think about how that could really increase their learning experience. Um, maybe it would help them not feel so much alone. This next slide, um, this next slide is just another aspect of the module that had, um, where basically we want to get the students talking about digital media literacy before we wanted to engage students in talking about the effects of technology on the library, and how technology has changed the library over the years. So to do so, we used an interactive timeline called Tiki Toki, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. And I'm going to share a link for the actual Tiki Toki that, that is an empty version of it that we can use. I mean, that you could use as just sort of a guide so you can kind of see how Tiki Toki is set up. But it's just a great way where uh, you can share a link to uh, to a Tiki Toki, think of it as a way for maybe you could set it up to where users have rights to be able to add entries into the Tiki Toki, where you might give an assignment where students are supposed to go home and find examples on the web, maybe it's images, videos, some sort of media or an article, and they can share it into uh, the Tiki Toki and they give it a specific date. Uh, here specifically, we talked about the effect of technology, so we were sharing things like when, when email was invented, the first computer, Project Gutenberg, things like that, just kind of to get us thinking about how technology has changed the library. Maybe you, as, an, as a teacher, you create a timeline of resources. You curate a bunch of content for your students, organize it on a timeline, and then you lock it down where they can edit it or change it, but they can go in and explore the content uh, in this interactive timeline. So think of using something like that. Um, this here is we just, uh, it, through the rest of the module, there does have to be some presentation of content, so that's what we're kind of doing over these next couple slides, just so I can give you an example of how that content was given to them. I try not to give them too much content on one page. I try to not necessarily have the user scroll, because it, it will be called is sometimes in the instructional design, uh, or even if you're you're doing graphic design for like a newspaper, you think of talk about things that being below the fold, things that are below the fold, maybe they don't see. So essentially the students get to the very next page and I want to make sure in a snapshot they can pretty much see everything they need on that page if I can. And I try to, you know, with some instructional design, we also call it chunking. Um, so again, I'm presenting content. I have some custom images here. Uh, this is actually an example of some content that we curated from somewhere else online, but we wanted to make sure they had access to it in the e-learning course, so it was rebuilt here. Um, and then we finally get to some content that's very text heavy, showing a bunch of different data. Um, so, so this is basically some data that discusses librarians in the digital age. And conveniently, this particular group of librarians are really wanting to learn about infographics. Uh, I'm sure many of you might, say, might be interested in infographics. You probably are a fan of learning from them yourself. Um, and, but these librarians are actually interested in figuring out ways to actually build them for their library. So this, this data here, in one way, is presented just simple text. But on this next page, this is an example of an infographic that was shared of that exact same data. And I'm just, just kind of quickly just showing you a snapshot of, of it so you can kind of see an example of, some, of all that uh, data that is now shared kind of in a visual way, in, in a way that uh, through, this, through this infographic. And then on this next page, we actually discuss some differences between um, learning versus just text for learning uh, in an infographic. And then we also discuss the biggest challenges for librarians from, uh, of the digital age. So the, the students essentially could you know, be participating in this e learning module, discussing back and forth, having interaction with each other, having that human element discussing, discussing the content. Later on in the, in the module, you're going to see where we actually prepare the students for creating their own infographics. Now, this next page here, is they were presented an article for them to read. Um, and you notice, man, what's this word cloud over here on the right? Well, what we did with this word cloud here is we took all of the text from the article and we put it into a tool 
called Wordle. I don't know if you're familiar with Wordle, but it's a way to make word clouds. So basically, it's kind of a neat way to put text into this uh, JavaScript, not JavaScript, into a Java tool online. It's all free, and it's basically going to showcase the most the most prominent words in the article and create these create these engaging word clouds. Um, so basically, this word cloud here is an image that was used to kind of kind of introduce the students to the article, essentially. Um, and maybe that's something that you could use as you're creating perhaps some sort of an e-learning experience or you wanted to create some sort of uh, uh, of an image to kind of uh, showcase what's the key things um, in our article. And then on this next page is an example of the article that they were going to read. But then we get to the assignment where they were actually asked to, that article that they just read. Now let's take some of that data and we can actually make um, make an infographic from it. So that's where that's how we brought in the use of creating an infographic. You notice here at the bottom that there was actually a rubric that was how the infographic was was graded. Um, but check out PictoChart is a is a great free tool where you get lots of different templates that you can use to make um, make infographics. And it's a great way to get students to go in and maybe maybe give them an assignment where. Um, uh, create an infographic about an article. Maybe every maybe someone takes maybe every student in the class is working on a presentation. They're all researching something different. Instead of just reading their paper to the class, they can all go out and create an infographic of their own research and then share it with the class. So it's just different ways that you can get the students to present things online. This next this next page is an example of a Twitter chat um, because some people think, well, why in the world would we use Twitter? Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a course of higher learning, or would you ever consider using Twitter in, in a K-12 setting? Um, I'm guessing that many of your students are probably on Twitter, um, but have they ever thought about using Twitter for learning? Um, and you're also noticing, well, hey, Dave, this timeline is empty. That's because whenever you embed a Twitter chat into a specific area, there's reasons why you might want to embed Twitter. Rather than just op opening up Twitter for the whole class to see, you can actually curate and decide for them a specific hashtag for them to see, and you can actually embed a Twitter chat somewhere, maybe on your on your classroom's website or on the e-learning LMS that you're using. But this is just an example of it. Uh, normally, those chats only stay in that embed for <coughs> for only 21 days. This is just an example. We asked um, the question was, you know, what can librarians do to increase the digital media literacy of their library patrons? And this is just how people of my Twitter followers responded to that as an example. But let's just think about using Twitter in the class. Is it of value to get students to connect? and connect with each other socially using the mediums that they already have? Is that of value to your class? Is it of value to get maybe the outside perspective of other people that aren't even in your class to tweet with your class to talk about some sort of topic? Is it of value, perhaps, to have alumni to your course from previous years chatting with your current students about uh, specific topics or things like that? Or maybe it's a way for you to bring outside content that's going on in the world. Like maybe you have a hash that you want your students to follow about international policy or something like that. Imagine all around the world how that hashtag is used and how that essentially can bring content into your into your classroom. And this would be something that you could use maybe in a face-to-face -face or in, a, in an online e-learning experience. So think about how that might add value. So let's recap where we are so far. That is kind of the end of the module where I showcase some different tools. Um, we've talked about students learning alone. We've talked about the human elements, um, the, the benefits of authentic learning and, on, and online interaction. We talked about the differences between an invention and an innovation, and we talked about adding value. So now the next thing we need to talk about is the is just the notion of an e-learner. Um, our e-learners um, are very different than than maybe they have in the past. Like for example, here, this is an image from 2005. Because uh, remember, learning is a change, but our learners are changing, perhaps through the use of their technology and current technology trends. For example, this is the Papal, the Papal inauguration of 2005, and now um, in 2013, notice how the learners are connecting with this event. Um, it's very they're connecting with it in a very different way. And I'm sure that you'd agree that our learners in the landscape of their learning through the mediums and methods is very much changing. And it's changing in your own classrooms as you speak. Now in 2013, our learners are essentially wanting easy access to their learning. They want it to be free. They want it on their phones. They want badges instead of grades. 
Somewhere between five and seven million students have taken at least one online class. Twice as many institutions are offering at least one online course than those that don't. What about the 300,000 students that connected in the world's largest MOOC recently on Udacity with their CS101 course? 300,000 students collect in a course. It's just amazing. So what do we do? Well, it's always up to, as I say to all my web design students, um, it's about the user and their needs. So maybe we should find a way to connect with our students socially. Uh, students have a need to connect with their peers socially, and they, want, they don't want to feel like they're learning alone. They want the course to come outside of the course walls and into their pockets. They want access to the content on their devices and social media that they already have. They don't want to learn alone, and they want to feel like they're connected. So, but I still feel like there's one thing that's missing from this list. And what I believe what's missing from this list is us, the e-teacher. Now, an e-teacher, um, I'd like to kind of talk about the e-teacher by using an analogy um, that I heard a while back, and I, I tried Googling it to find it. It was an analogy I heard at a conference a couple of years ago, and I can't seem to find it. But this image is an image of a blimp flying over the Los Angeles skyline. This image is so surreal. Imagine for a moment that we take some students up into a blimp and teach them about geography concepts like urban sprawl. So it's such an amazing way for students to learn about geography, right, being up in a blimp. But instead of encouraging students to look outside at the landscape around them, we're telling them to turn to chapter seven of their geography book and forcing them to look at a globe that an instructor is holding up in front of the book. How sad would that be? So some teachers are reluctant and don't feel up for the innovation and are worried about what could potentially do, the innovation could do to their class. E-learning may not be very new to us because we're, you know, we're attending an online conference, but to uh, to our students and maybe to some people that we are working with as instructional technologists, instructional designers, or maybe other uh, faculty members in our universities or teachers in our schools, that maybe they're reluctant and maybe they need some inspiration. So what's an e-teacher to do? E-teachers tell their students to look outside of the blimp and observe the world around them. And sometimes I think that teaching online is, some people think that teaching online is different than a face-to-face -face course, but the teaching is, is just like learning, has been around since the dawn of civilization and since the start of our students' lives. And teaching online, what makes a successful online teacher is what makes a successful face-to-face -face teacher. So whatever you do in a face-to-face -face classroom, you need to figure out how to do that in an online uh, environment as well. Content expertise, attentiveness to students, kind of like what we were with me and Nikki were talking about uh, earlier um, with an instructor not being there in the, in the discussion board. I mean, imagine if you had a face-to-face -face class and uh, you were standing at the front of the room, students were talking to you and you, talking to you, and you never responded. Uh, so content expertise, attentiveness to students, timely responses to student questions, and being organized are just a few of the important qualifications of a successful teacher, regardless of mediums and methods. So many people think teaching online is different. I mean, it's, sometimes I will say it's more work, but it's not necessarily different. Uh, technology will come and go, and we will continue to migrate content from one platform to another. One year, it was MySpace, and the next, it's Facebook. Content is what the learners need to learn, and it's up to us to make sure the technology doesn't get in the way. Here's a quote that I love from Scott Robinson from Plymouth State University. We don't want technology to drive the change. It's up to the instructor to determine what the learning objectives are and look at how certain tools might help them get there faster, better, and easier. So those different tech tools that I share, like Tiki Toki and Wordle or PictoChart, you know, there's millions of others of them. And if you connect with me, um, if you connect with me socially on these different meetings, you'll see that I, I beta test different tools and I blog about them. But I always try to figure out, you know, how can we use this tool to increase learning? I have people that tell me, hey, Dave, when you check out this new tool, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to use that tool in the classroom? So. Another thing I'd like to point out before I open up for questions that I hope that we can collaborate, and on that symbol that I shared earlier, I'm going to throw the link out again. Um, I'm pointing on the slide to a specific Google, Google Doc. Um, I'm pointing, uh, so basically this here is a collaborative document where we can, it's all open where we can go in and talk about different tools. I have it broken down in groups of tools basically to design courses and tools that can be used to uh, teach courses in. So lots of different tools for collaboration there. So I hope to connect with you 
um, in the different mediums like Twitter and, and follow each other's blogs and things like that, but I also hope we can chat about these different tools um, here as well. And I'll show the, throw this link in the chat as well. So if you're interested in going into the Google Doc later, I will be there as well. So uh, let's see what questions we have so far. We have about 10 more minutes or so, but I'm, the room is open for just a little bit. We can continue chatting about these different things, but I'm interested to hear from you. There's a few of you that are still here. Um, do you have any thoughts about some things that I've shared? Um, have any uh, things that we can kind of just open up to the group to chat about? Nikki wrote, what happened to the red apple? I don't know what you mean by that. Beverly, like, Beverly wrote, uh, how about a blended course? What would you diff what would you do differently than what you have just discussed? Okay, a blended course, uh, d depending on the definition, generally I'm guessing that's where students have some of the course they're supposed to do online and some of the aspects that they're supposed to do uh, in the classroom. So I would so when you flip your class, that's kind of a way to think about leveraging your time in a classroom in the best way that you can. So you're not going to have all of your students show up with you in your classroom, your face-to-face -face classroom, and take a test, because the test can be done online. You're not going to have the students show up to the classroom and read from a textbook, because that essentially can be done um, online. But what I'm chatting about in terms of this e-learning experience is I want to make sure that when you do give them things online in that e-learning component of the blended course that you need to kind of remember this framework. And I think one of the key things is probably making sure that things are not distracting, making sure everything that you, you have there is added value. Because in a blended course, I don't know how much students really feel alone necessarily because they do spend a lot of time with you in the face-to-face -face class. But I will say that you're, I don't want you to take your face-to-face -face class up, try to explain to them, you know, where everything is, um, if it's not organized well, or if there's lots of content or things in the modules and things that you're sharing with them online that's very distracting. Um, so I think probably in a blended course, in my opinion, the best thing is just making sure that you're utilizing um, that aspect of the course and, and giving them, making sure everything really adds value to them. Nikki writes, teachers expect uh, students to give them red colored apple, not a green one. That's, yeah, that image, let me bring that back. Yeah, that, that image was a, I actually personally prefer the more bitter, the more bitter, uh, harder, uh, crunchier apples, for me personally. Um, what other questions do you have? Uh, did that answer your question, Beverly, about blended courses? Oh, cool. Uh, would anybody like for me to unmute the, the microphones? Maybe Nikki could help me with that. If anybody would like to just kind of, we can just all chat for the next 10 minutes. Because it looks like we just have Beverly and Kathy are still here. Um, is there some things that uh, really hit home for you in this presentation that we, I can maybe elaborate on or you can kind of maybe apply it to your own settings and share with us? I would love the opportunity to give this similar presentation to maybe uh, people that you work with, uh, maybe on site. Uh, if we could figure out how to do that, because um, I've definitely done lots of professional development with other teachers sharing you know, different e-learning technologies and talking about how to use it in their own school settings. Um, that would be something I would I really enjoy doing if anybody had a need for that, a professional development in their in your schools. Uh, Kathy, just wrote, I just finished coaching a digital learning MOOC and you were a great uh, follow for me. So uh, are you saying that me and you were in a MOOC together? Or, or oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, that the MOOC, this is a good, this is a good follow to kind of recap uh, your thoughts about being in a MOOC. Or no, you, you know, recap your thoughts of maybe wayfinding a MOOC with other students. What MOOC did you, did you teach, Kathy? Many of what we talk about uh, in technology in the classroom, yeah, we're good. Um, I'm very interested in connecting with you all. If you're interested, uh, share with me uh, maybe your uh, Twitter uh, I, Twitter handle, if you guys do Twitter, that I don't already have it. Um, or maybe if you have a blog or if there's a way we can connect through email. I do have my email on this slide. Let me put it here in the chat so you can easily copy and paste it. But definitely, it should be an email. I would love uh, to connect with you. And she wrote, uh, Kathy, I already followed 
follow you already on Twitter. Great. Am I following you, Kathy? If I'm not, I definitely want to. Um, yeah, I'm going to go to my Twitter and search for you, I assume. I hope I do. Okay, Nikki, Nikki shot me her email. Uh, I'm finding a Kathy Ann Cope on Twitter, but I don't. It doesn't show that you're actually following me. Can you share with us your Twitter handle, Kathy? Your MOOC was from North Carolina State. What was the name of the MOOC? Coaching Digital Learning. Okay, cool. I'll have to check that one out. The audio permission has been turned on for both for both of you, if you're interested in chatting with us, over in the top left, there's the talk button. You could press down the talk button and you can start chatting with us if you have a microphone. Dave? Yes. Can you hear Hi, me? Kathy. <laughs> yes. I, I just, um, uh, this whole area is really new to me. So I took the MOOC and then part of what we're doing in our exploration, I came across your website and I see you from time to time. You get mentioned a lot in my Twitter thing, so I'm not sure whether I'm following you, but I read you a lot. Oh, cool. Well, great. It, it is really cool. Yeah, it's neat. I, it, it's neat. I, when I teach online, I love actually having a moment to really just talk to someone, you know, uh, over the internet rather than just, you know, connecting with words and screens. Yeah. So this is neat to be able to connect with someone. Yeah, yeah. It's been really, really fun. And you said that you have a new Oh, that's Beverly, who has a new book out, How to Teach a Practical Guide for Librarians. Can you tell us a little bit more about your book, Beverly? Your mic's on if you're able to um, chat. No. Okay. Oh, can you hear me now? Hi, Beverly. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, this is a, is a book um, for... Um, librarians mainly and and uh, but teachers could use it too and it's really uh, talking about the different ways to the different modes of teaching you know whether it's face to face or whether it's blended or whether it's online or one to one in public libraries and the idea behind it was that librarians particularly don't get a, an opportunity to learn about teaching in their library courses and so that's why I was asked to write this book. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. If there's anything I can do to help with that, uh, let, let me know. You are, you are now, I guess, right? Yeah, there may be because they want me to do another one. <laughs> well, good, good. Beverly, this is Nikki. Have you ever presented at uh, Library 2.0 that they offer every year in October? I haven't. Um, actually, my background is in, in teaching, but I, I, I work as well as teaching. I work for a company, Dialogue, which is an online information service, uh, creating their materials and, and, and things like that, newsletters, for 24 years. So, you know, that's how I got involved with the library groups. Okay, sure. My, my, my PhD is in English. Uh-huh. Oh. Well, I'm sure there's room for you, for everybody here, <laughs> and to present at any one of uh, Steve Hargadon's uh, conferences, worldwide conferences. So uh, Steve Hargadon is a magic name. Yes, I know who he is. He'll point you in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. Let me encourage you. you. Uh, just as Dave is here, we would certainly enjoy hearing from uh, from you as well. So thank you.
could you share with me your email, Beverly? I'd like to make sure that we uh, get connected, and I, I definitely want to check out your book. Okay, thank you. Well, if there's nothing else that we, we can chat about, I, I'm definitely up for sticking around and chatting for I, I was kind of thinking of jumping into some of the other sessions. Um, Sounds good. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop, the, stop the recording. Uh, thanks, Kathy, for joining the session. I hope we can all connect. Thanks, Beverly. I never got your Twitter handle, Kathy. If you're still if you're still here, share it in the chat, and we'll make sure that we connect with you. I'll connect with you.